Amy Elliott. I'm a research scientist here at the MDF. Um, so Lonnie's been talking a lot about the BAM system, big area additive manufacturing. And before the BAM, this machine actually was the biggest printer we had. Um, it's really, really big. It's got a two foot by three foot by three foot build volume. Really, really massive build volume in here. But the thing about this printer is that it still has about a 400 micron nozzle. So the throughput of that nozzle is only about a cubic inch an hour. So if I actually wanted to fill this whole build volume, it would actually take over a year. So it's not super conducive for large builds. It is really great for larger builds with high resolution. So that is, it still has a purpose. It's still a really awesome machine. But in terms of making those big tooling members and those big car pieces, um, this. This particular platform is not, not well suited. Um, another thing about this machine is that it's actually got a heated build oven. The oven inside here is about 200 degrees Celsius. And for Department of Energy, 90, we've, we've calculated that 95% of the energy of this machine is to heat that build volume. And that's because when you're building something layer by layer, you're actually, um, the, the material is cooling and contracting, cooling and contracting with every layer. And so if you don't have a heated build chamber, you're actually gonna get a lot of warpage within the part. As it builds layer by layer, it's gonna warp up. So that's why this machine is printed. On the BAM system, we don't have the luxury of having a heated print bed. So it's actually our materials that make it possible for us to print without a heater. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Another great thing about the MDF that um, Lonnie has talked about is our first robotics program. So let's go take a look at that. So this is our awesome collection of FIRST robots. We do sponsor and um, mentor teams out of this facility. Um, so FIRST is a really great uh, high school competition. It stands for, for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. This is actually how I got into engineering. Without FIRST, I would never have chosen this, this field um, for my career. So it's a really, really great program. Our students are super spoiled because they get to 3D print their robots. So you can see all of our robots here, the, the little tan pieces are all 3D printed. Um, so they really get to go through the iteration process. So these are the first generation robots. These are the second generation. And so you'll notice that the, the newer robots are actually printed with the BAM technology. You can see the corduroy effect in each of their parts. Um, so I believe uh, on, in this particular season, they were able to go through four iterations of robots with the 3D printing technology. So it really, really um, speeds up their, de their design process and really helps them be more innovative. Um, so really great program. Once we train these students, give them skills, how to design for additive manufacturing, how to build things, how to make things work, we then recruit them for internships and then hopefully um, they'll come back to work for us full time. So really great program. Um, training students, outreaching, and then bring, give, uh, giving us a great pipeline to recruit from. So now we're gonna go talk about some small scale or desktop 3D printers. So these are our desktop or consumer based 3D printers. These are the less expensive version. So I actually have one of these at home. It's the Solid Doodle third gen. It was about 800 bucks. Uh, I got it for graduation. My sister and my husband gave it to me. Um, so these are really actually awesome for research because they are so inexpensive and they're pretty analogous to the larger scale FDM systems. In fact, the carbon filled ABS that we use on the BAM system, which is why the BAM actually works today, was actually originally printed on one of these desktop systems. So we found that with the desktop system, we had a lot more control, a lot more accuracy with a carbon-filled ABS than we did with the normal ABS. So really, really great for research. Um, so you can see that this is just plain old FDM technology like we've been talking about this whole time. We take a string of plastic and then it gets driven into a hot nozzle with some drive gears. And then that hot nozzle squirts out that molten plastic and then draws the shape of each layer. So it's just like a little tiny hot glue gun uh, putting down traces of material. Um, so we, that's how we build the object layer by layer. So the most important thing to remember about additive manufacturing or 3D printing is that there's more than one way to do that. In fact, there's about seven different technologies available right now, commercially available, to actually 3D print something. This is our second technology that we're gonna talk about. This is called PolyJet. The first one was FDM. We're extruding a hot plastic through a nozzle. Um, this one, we're depositing a photopolymer, or a liquid resin, uh, with an inkjet nozzle into the shape of the layer of the part. So we have this liquid um, resin. It comes as a liquid in a jug. It gets sucked into a, a pipe, 
and then it gets piped out through the inkjet nozzle and just sprayed into layers. So we spray a layer of polymer and then we cure it with the UV light, spray another layer, cure it with the UV light, and we spraying and curing and eventually we'll build up these three-dimensional parts. So the great thing about inkjet is that you get really, really high resolution, like 30 microns, 16 microns resolution. In fact, the layer resolution on this machine is 17 microns, so you can't really even see the layers anymore. So really, really high resolution, really great surface finish, um, really great feature sizes. Another great thing about inkjet is that you can do multiple materials. So just like you can do multiple colors, like on your inkjet printer at home, you can do multiple materials here and then mix them. Um, so we have this stiff white plastic and then we have this rubbery black plastic. And then we can mix them to get the shades of gray in between. So we can actually tailor the durometer of our part throughout the part. Um, and there's a lot of advantages to that. So really, really interesting process using inkjet the only downside to this technology is that the material properties are still pretty lacking. Photopolymers have a long way to go. All of my little toys are broken in some way. Um, but you can do uh, assemblies, no assembly required. So if you get the clearances right between the joints, you can do mechanisms like this chain, no assembly required. Now, of course, this is a plastic chain. You wouldn't want to put this on your bicycle. Um, but it's a really great way to model things. So here at Oak Ridge, instead of um, asking the question, what are the structural applications for this technology since we don't really have the structural properties that we need to do that. Um, we want to ask the functional application. So maybe a functional application is a printed circuit board. We can use this dual ink uh, process to deposit an inkjet uh, sil nano silver and then inkjet our um, non-conductive pho photopolymer. And then we can make this uh, composite structure that's actually got a functional, functional properties. So, really interesting technology uh, called PolyJet. So the last technology I'm going to talk to you about today, um, and then Ryan's going to take over for some metals, is the inkjet, the binder jet technology. So my background's in inkjet, so this is actually my favorite technology. Um, instead of actually depositing our build material like we, we did in material jetting with the PolyJet, here we're depositing a binder into our build material. So we take our build material, which in this case is a stainless steel powder. Um, we deposit the binder into that powder bed using our inkjet print head. And that's how we're actually gonna shape the parts layer by layer. So we deposit our powder, we deposit our binder, we heat the binder, we deposit more powder and do that layer by layer. When it's done, we actually take that whole build out of the, uh, of the printer and we put it in a curing oven, cured at about 200 degrees Celsius, and then actually we'll cure that binder and lock it in. Um, at that point, we can dig our part out of the powder bed, kind of like archaeologists do with bones. Um, and then we have what's called a green part. So the green part is strong enough to hold its geometry but if I were to put some pressure on this geometry, it would actually break. So it has kind of a little snap to it. I can actually break green parts apart. Um, so glued together metal powder, that's not useful. So the last process that we have is the centering. So we heat this powder, we heat the print up to its centering temperature. And that's when the particles are hot enough to stick, but they don't flow, we're not melting. And then we get a part that's like this. So this is no longer green. Um, it's only actually 60% dense, and that's because of the packing factor of our particle. We are working on getting single alloy materials that are fully dense, um, but in this case, this is, this is what we have. So if we do want a fully dense metal structure, we could actually put some bronze in with, in the furnace process and then that bronze will melt at a lower temperature and wick up into the part using capillary forces. So this would be an example of that, how we've got some bronze in with the part itself. And then when it's done, it'll be 100% dense, just like this part. So that's how we make fully dense metal parts using plain old low tech, you know, low tech inkjet technology. So this is a really cool part. It's really difficult to get the tools into all of these crevices to get the desired shape. So with additive though, this is an easy part to make. With additive, complexity is free. So you get the shape for free. And they found that by using this material system instead of the tool steel, they actually had an increase of the tool lifetime from two weeks to six weeks. And that's because the sand that they were drilling with would get stuck in that bronze matrix and act as a sacrificial wear surface. So there's a lot of cases where this is a really great material system. Our research is taking us towards densifying these low density printed structures. Um, we're, going to, we're going to try to predict the warpage and shrinkage along the way so that we can act, actually end up with the geometry that we want. 
in a fully dense material. Um, another great thing about binder jet is that it's pretty universal to whatever material I want to print. So if you go outside, you can give me some dirt, I'll sieve it and I can print it into a shape. It's just what do you want to do with that dirt later. On that note, we can actually print foundry sand. So this is an example that was printed out of foundry sand. And if you know anything about sand casting, you know that creating this pattern is actually a pretty complex process. You have to start out with your shape that you want to cast. You have to make that out of a wood pattern or a polymer pattern or wax or styrofoam. And then you have to press the sand around it. And then somehow you have to get that pattern out. You have to cut the, cast, the, the sand open. So it's a really, really involved process. There's a lot of technique, a lot of black art to it. Well, binder jetting is actually taking some of that art and turning it into science. And so now we can actually create these sand cast patterns without the need to create that positive pattern in the first place. So we can just directly print the sand, cast right into it, get the shape that we want. Um, so the, this is actually really improving the casting industry. Not only does it give us more geometrical control over the part that we want to print, but it's also making that sand pack a lot more uniformly packed. So it's, uh, there's not different areas of density. There's actually very uniform density within the, the sand cast mold. So really bringing some um, consistency to an otherwise really consistent, inconsistent and tricky um, process. So this is our binder jet machine. It's got a really big build volume. And actually the throughput on binder jet is really, really great. Um, the, the actual time it takes to deposit the binder is not very much. So if you wanted to pack a lot of different parts within the printer itself, it doesn't really add to the build time. On that same note, I can actually cure all the parts at the same time because they're on the same build pack. And then I can center and infiltrate them all at the same time. So this process is really, really conducive for mass manufacturing. So I can give you an example. We did a test print. We printed on the electron beam and the binder jet just to, to do a race to see which one would, would be faster. And the electron beam actually produced the geometry fastest. Um, it was about 25 hours. But then the binder jet produced the same geometry in about 32 hours. But that's all three steps of the process. But what we found is if you double that order, the binder jet would actually take about still 32 hours to create that, that part. And that's because, like I said, the more parts you put into that build pack, it doesn't really increase the build time. Um, whereas the electron beam, that time scales more directly. So you can see with binder jet, because it is a batch-wise process, we can actually print lots of parts all at once um, in a short amount of time. Another great thing about the binder jet process is that it's really scalable. So unlike the laser or the electron beam processes, we don't have a vacuum chamber, we don't have to inert our printing atmosphere. So our printers can actually be really, really small and really, really cost effective. So this is our lab, lab scale printer. It's got a 30 millimeter by 40 by 60 millimeter build volume, so really small. And the great thing about that is that I can do research with new materials on this system without having to buy gallons and gallons of powder. And if you know anything about metal powder, you know that can, that's really, really expensive. So this is a really great uh, system that we use for experimental research to see if our binder is compatible with the materials, to see if the materials want to center and densify, just basically explore lots of different materials that we can use with the binder jet process. So as you can see, inkjet's a really, really versatile technology in 3D printing or additive manufacturing. Um, we can do polymers, we can do ceramics, we can do metals, anything powdered. Um, we can print, to print and glue together. So that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed this part of the tour. And next you'll get to see Ryan talking about the electron beam and the laser and some of the other metal processes.